Welcome back. This is the second video considering the use of payoff tables and how they can help us to make decisions when faced with risk. In this video, we'll consider the impact risk attitudes have on our decisions, the value of additional information that's guaranteed to be correct, known as perfect information, and decision making with more than one risky variable. Let's remind ourselves about Jack the sandwich shop owner. He was asked if he would like to sign a contract with a local conference centre for the regular daily supply of sandwiches, which although they weren't as profitable as off the street sales, nevertheless helped use some spare capacity. We constructed a payoff table. The table shows the contribution that would arise depending on the decision Jack makes across the top and the risky variable down the left hand side. We concluded that if Jack was risk neutral, he would make his decision using expected values on the balance of probabilities. We calculated this by multiplying the outcome by the probability of its occurrence. So for example, if Jack signs up to supply 100 sandwiches a day to the conference centre, the first column, he on average could expect a contribution of 0.2 times 400 plus 0.5 times 700 plus 0.3 times 850 is $685. We said that the expected contribution was maximised when Jack agreed to supply 150 sandwiches a day to the conference centre. This assumes he is risk neutral and is willing to base his decisions on the average outcome. Jack, however, may not be risk neutral. He could be risk averse or risk seeking. A risk averse decision maker is in essence a pessimist and assumes that poor outcomes will occur following their decision. They therefore make the decision that will make that poor outcome the best it can possibly be. This is known as the maximin approach, maximizing the minimum possible return. We can use the payoff table again to help us here. We can use this table in a different way to help us with a maximin decision. Look at the first column. If we sign up to supply 100 sandwiches to the conference centre, the worst possible outcome is when off the street demand is 100. If we repeat this exercise for the second and third columns, the bottom row is showing us the worst case scenario or worst possible outcome associated with each decision. The best of these occurs if Jack signs up for 200 sandwiches with the conference centre. So, if Jack is risk averse, he will choose to sign up to supply 200 sandwiches a day to the conference centre, because if he does this and the worst happens, in other words, off the street demand turns out to be low, his outcome will be the best it can be in those bad circumstances. If Jack is risk seeking, he is by nature more of an optimist. He assumes good outcomes will follow from his decisions and therefore will focus on the upside potential. He will choose the option that gives him the maximum possible return. He will ignore the downside possibility attached to the decision. If we look at the table, the biggest possible contribution occurs when we sign up to supply 100 sandwiches to the conference centre and off the street demand is 300. We would earn a contribution of $850 in this case. This decision criteria is known as Maximax. It maximises the maximum possible outcome. You'll note here Jack is being optimistic. If he selects this option, he is conveniently ignoring the fact that if off the street demand is low, he will only earn $400, the worst possible return. A slightly different approach to risk aversion is to focus on opportunity costs. A risk averse individual may seek to choose the option that minimises the size of the error they made in hindsight. In other words, they don't want to be too disappointed when they look back that they could have made a better choice. This involves constructing a table of opportunity costs, which again uses the payoff table as a starting point. 
The opportunity cost table has the same structure and headings as the payoff table. The table is completed crossways but read downwards. Consider the first row on the payoff table. If it turns out off the street demand was 100, then the best decision we could have made in hindsight would have been to accept an order of 200 from the conference centre. This would give the maximum possible return. The opportunity cost or regret would be zero. It was the best decision Jack could have made with hindsight. However, if it turns out off the street demand was 100 and Jack had agreed to supply 150 sandwiches to the conference centre, he would have secured a contribution of $450 rather than the $500 he would have gained if he'd agreed to supply 200 sandwiches. In other words, this is 500 less 450 or $50 lower than the optimum or $50 opportunity cost or regret from having chosen the wrong decision in hindsight. If it turns out off the street demand was 100 and Jack had accepted an order for 100 sandwiches, he would have secured a contribution of $400 rather than the 500 he would have gained if he'd agreed to supply 200. In other words, this is 500 less 400 is $100 lower than the optimum, or $100 opportunity cost or regret from having chosen the wrong decision in hindsight. If we repeat this process for off the street demand of 200 and 300, in other words the other two rows in the table, we will have completed Jack's opportunity cost table. We use the table by reading down each column. For example, the first column. If Jack agrees to supply 100 sandwiches, his worst possible regret or opportunity cost is $100. In other words, at worst, he will be $100 off the best outcome he could have expected. So, Jack's maximum possible regret is minimised by choosing to supply either 100 or 150 sandwiches to the conference centre, as each choice has a maximum regret or opportunity cost associated with it of $100. This approach is known as minimax regret and is a form of risk aversion. Imagine Jack is poised to make his decision, let's say based on expected values the risk neutral choice. He's about to agree to supply the conference centre with 150 sandwiches regularly with an expected value of $690. The phone rings. A disguised voice says, meet me in the car park in 10 minutes. Curious, Jack goes and meets a man in the shadows clutching an envelope. The man says, in this envelope is some perfect information. It will tell you exactly, with no doubt, what off the street demand will be. However, You'll have to pay me to obtain this information. Jack thinks he hasn't yet agreed to supply the conference centre, so once he knows what's in the envelope, he can supply the optimum amount to maximise his contribution. However, Jack doesn't know at this moment exactly what is in the envelope. As far as he is concerned, there is a 0.2 chance that off the street demand will be 100, in which case he would then agree to supply 200 sandwiches to the conference centre earning him a contribution of $500. There is a 0.5 chance that off the street demand will be 200, in which case he would then agree to supply 150 sandwiches to the conference centre earning him a contribution of $750. There is a 0.3 chance that off the street demand will be 300, in which case he would then agree to supply 100 sandwiches to the conference centre, earning him a contribution of $850. As Jack stands looking at the envelope, if he could obtain this information at no cost before committing to the conference centre, the value of his decision would now be 0.2 times $500 plus 0.5 times $750 plus 0.3 times $850 is $730. This is the value of the decision with perfect information. 
The value with no such information was simply the expected value he had calculated before the mysterious phone call, which was $690. The value of the perfect information is therefore 730 less 690 is $40. Provided he can purchase the information for less than $40, he will be improving his overall outcome by doing so. Of course, in the real world, no information is perfect, but this helps us to understand how much worse off we are because of a lack of perfect information, which might in turn help us to understand how much information is worth that reduces, even if it doesn't completely eliminate uncertainty. More on this later when we look at decision trees. Sometimes we may face more than one risky variable. For example, suppose we're unsure as to what sales might be and fixed costs. We think sales might be with a probability of 0.5, 0.3 and 0.2 respectively. We also believe fixed costs could be $10,000, $11,000 or $12,000 with a probability of 0.3, 0.3 and 0.4 respectively. Suppose we wanted to calculate as a risk neutral decision maker what expected profits are if contribution per unit is $4. Let's start by scheduling this out in a table. We're going to use this template three times. One table for profit, one table for probability, and a final table for profit multiplied by probability. Firstly, the one for profit. We populate the table with the profit that will result from every given level of sales demand and fixed cost. For example, in the top left hand corner, sales is 1000 units and fixed cost is $10,000. So profit is 10,000 units times $4 contribution minus $10,000 cost is $30,000. A similar approach for the other boxes gives us now the second table for probabilities. We start with the same template as before. Only this time we work out the joint probabilities. So for example in the top left hand corner the probability of sales being 10,000 units and fixed costs being $10,000 is 0.5 multiplied by 0.3 is 0.15. A similar approach for the other boxes gives us the following. You'll note that the total of the probabilities adds to 1. Finally, the profit multiplied by probability table. Again, we start with the same template as before. This time, we overlay the first two tables. For example, the top left hand corner. Probability in this box is 0.15 and profit was $30,000. So probability multiplied by profit is 0.15 multiplied by $30,000 is $4,500. Then if we complete the other boxes we get the following. As before the expected value is the sum of probability times value. So if we add up all nine values in this table we could also say that profit will range from $28,000 to $40,000. We could also say, for example, that there is a 0.35 chance of profit being less than $30,000. This occurs in these two boxes, which have associated joint probabilities of which totals to 0.15 plus 0.2 equals 0.35 or 35 percent. In other words, joint probability tables are useful things that tell us more than simply expected values. In this video we've considered how to build risk attitude into decision making, how much perfect information is worth to us, and how to use joint probability distributions to help us with decisions. All these techniques assume we know probabilities and values. Often both are estimates at best.